Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in once again. So we're going to read from this book. We've read it before. A couple of chapters. A lot of great info here. We're going to get into. There's two volumes of this with so much information. When we start getting deeper and deeper with the history of certain religions, mythology, and culture, there's definitely some babies to pull out of this book. And of course, we're always going to dodge the hijack when we see it. The book is Anacalypsis, an attempt to draw aside the veil of the Saitic Isis, or an inquiry into the origin of languages, nations, and religions by Godfrey Higgins. This is volume one. This is written in 1836. So again, this uh, volume includes many books, I believe 10 books. We're in book one, chapter four. And it says here, two ancient Ethiopias. There's two Ethiopias, huh? The two Ethiopias. Great black nation in Asia. The black nation in Asia. The Buddha of India, a Negro. The Arabians were Kushites, Menon, shepherd kings, Hindus and Egyptians similar. Syria people from India. In taking a survey of the human inhabitants of the world, we find two classes distinguished from each other by a clear and definite line of demarcation, the black and white colors of their skins. That's the hijack with the crayon colors. This distinguishing mark we discovered to have existed in ages the most remote. If we suppose them all to have descended from one pair, the question arises, was that pair black or so-called white? If I were at present to say that I thought them black, I should be accused of a fondness for paradox, and I should find a few persons to agree with me, as the African Negroes do when they tell Europeans that the devil is white. And yet no one, except a West India planter, will deny that the poor Africans have reason on their side. All right, that's the, the hijack with the whole out of Africa theories and that every so-called black person came out of Africa, because that's literally what they're insinuating. But let's see what point he's getting to. However, I say not that they were black, but I shall, in the course of this work, produce a number of extraordinary facts which will be quite sufficient to prove that a black race in very early times had more influence over the affairs of the world than has been lately suspected. And I think I shall show by some very striking circumstances yet existent that the effects of this influence have not entirely passed away. <laughs> All right, so he's like, I'm not going to say Adam and Eve are black, but I am going to say that there seems to be a lot of proof that melanated people had strong influence over the affairs of the world. It's just really silly for them to not even consider that. You know what I mean? Like, duh. <laughs> but at least they're admitting to have found the evidence. It was the opinion of Sir William Jones that a great nation of blacks formerly possessed the dominion of Asia 
and held the seat of empire of Sidon. This must have been the people called by Mr. Maurice Cushites or Cotites described in Genesis. And the opinion that they were blacks is corroborated by the translators of the Pentateuch called the Seventy, constantly rendering the word Cush by Ethiopia. It is very certain that if this opinion be well founded, we must go for the time when this empire flourished to a period anterior to all our regular histories. It can only be known to have existed from accidental circumstances which have escaped amidst the ruins of empires and the wrecks of time. All right. So they're like, oh, there was a black empire. They're trying to make it seem like this was the only, though. That's the high attack. And remember, black is a crayon color. We're going to have future videos on the so-called black nations of Asia. We're just going to get our feet wet today. Of this nation, we have no account. That's what they say, right? We don't know anything about them. But it must have flourished after the deluge. And as our regular chronological systems fill up the time between the flood and what is called known undoubted history, if it be allowed to have existed, its existence will of course prove that no dependence can be placed on the early parts of that history. It will show that all the early chronology is false, for the story of this empire is not told. It is certain that its existence can only be known from insulated circumstances collected from various quarters and combining to establish the fact. But if I succeed in collecting a sufficient number to carry conviction to an impartial mind, the empire must be allowed to have existed. All right, they're like having so much trouble accepting this, and he's having so much trouble trying to explain this to his so-called white colleagues that believe they are the first people. <laughs> he's like, I'm still going to try, okay? The religion of Buddha of India is well known to have been very ancient. In the most ancient temples scattered throughout Asia, where his worship is yet continued, he is found black as yet, okay? He is found in the temples, in the walls, all right? On the temple walls, he is found black as yet, with a black face, thick lips, and curly hair of the Negro. This is what you're finding Buddha being represented as in these ancient temples we've shown that okay now remember previous videos we've done on buddha remember his first name guatemala guatemala his mom is maya who are the nagas who are the maya where is buddha really from several statues of him may be met with in the museum of the east india company there are two examplars of him broden on the face of the deep, upon a coiled serpent. To what time are we to allot this Negro? <laughs> you see what he's calling him? He will be proved to have been prior to the god called Krishna. He must have been prior or contemporaneous with the Black Empire, supposed by Sir William Jones to have flourished at Sidon. The religion of this Negro god is found by the ruins of his temples and other circumstances to have been spread over an immense extent of country, even to the remotest parts of Britain, and to have been professed by devotees inconceivably numerous. I very much doubt whether Christianity at this day is professed by more persons than yet profess the religion of Buddha. Of this, I shall say more hereafter. When several cities, countries, or rivers at great distances from each other are found to be called by the same name. The coincidence cannot be attributed to accident, but some specific cause for such an effect must be looked for. Thus we have several cities called Heliopolis, or the city of the sun, the reason for which is sufficiently obvious. Thus again, there were several Alexandrias, and on close examination we find two Ethiopias alluded to in ancient history, okay? Not just one. So when they're saying the Ethiopian Prester John, <laughs> one above the higher or southern part of Egypt and the other somewhere to the east of it. And as it has been thought in Arabia, the people of this latter are called Kushim in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and Ethiopians by the test of the Septuagint or the 70. 
that they cannot have been the Ethiopians of Africa is evident they're not talking about the Ethiopians of Africa. All right? I ain't saying it. He's letting you know it's evident from a single passage where they are said to have invaded Judah in the days of Asa. Judah or Utah. They invaded Utah under Serah, their king or leader. But the Lord smote the Cushim and Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerard. And the Ethiopians were overthrown. And they, for example, Asa and his people, smote all the cities round about Gerard. Whence it plainly follows that the Cushim here mentioned were such as inhabited the parts adjoining to Gerard and consequently but not any part of the African Ethiopia, but Arabia. When it is said that Asa smote the Cushites, or Ethiopians, in number a million of soldiers, as far as Gerard, and despoiled all the cities round about, it is absurd to suppose that Gerard and the lot of the tribe of Simeon is meant. The expression, all the cities and the millions of men, cannot apply to the little town of that tribe. Probably the city in Wilkinson's atlas, in the Tabula Orientalis at the side of the Persian Gulf, which is called Gera, is the city meant by the word Gerard. All right, he said, probably. And that Saba was near where it is placed by Dr. Stukli, or somewhere in the peninsula now called Arabia, or he doesn't know, right? He's guessing, because this is true old world occasions, might have been over here. And 2 Chronicles 21 16, it is said, and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians. This again shows that the Ethiopians were in the peninsula or bordered on it to the eastwards. They could not have lived to the west because the whole land of Egypt lay between them. All right, what Egypt? Ancient Egypt was here. So you see what I'm saying? If they went by land and the Red Sea lay between the two nations westward, the Red Sea, the Gulf of California, you mean? The Mar Vermelho or the Red Sea, the true Red Sea? So remember, apply all that you're reading with the real places. In Habakkuk 3.7, the words Midian and Kushan are used as synonyms. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. It is said in Numbers 12.1, and Miriam and Aaron sp spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Kusit, it appears that this Ethiopian woman was the daughter of Jethro, priest of Midian, near Horeb in Arabia. Dr. Wells was justly observed that the Kush spoken of in Scripture is evidently Arabia, from Numbers 12.1, just cited, and that it is also certain from Exodus 2.15-21 that the wife of Moses was Midianitish, a woman, and it is proved that Midian, or Madayan, was in Arabia, from Exodus 3.1, and consequently the Kush here spoken of and called Ethiopia must certainly mean Arabia. He also proves from Ezekiel 29, 10, that when God says he will make the land desolate from the Tower of Syene to the borders of Ethiopia, Cush, he cannot mean an African Cush, because he evidently means from one boundary of Egypt to the other. And as Syene is the southern boundary between the African Ethiopia and Egypt, it cannot possibly be that he speaks of the former, but of the other end of Egypt, which is Arabia. Yeah, that's if Egypt was over there, right? We already know ancient Egypt was here. So where was Arabia really, huh? The circumstance of the translators of the Septuagint version of the Pentateuch, having rendered the word Kush by the word Ethiopia, is a very decisive proof that the theory of the Ethiopians is well founded. Let the translators have been who they may, it is totally impossible to believe that they could be so ignorant as to suppose that the African Ethiopia could border on the Euphrates, or that the Kushites could be African Ethiopians. All right, they're not African Ethiopians, huh? From all the accounts which modern travelers gave of the country above Siin, there does not appear either from ruins or any other circumstance reason to believe that it was ever occupied by a nation strong enough to fight the battles and make the great figure in the world which we know the people called Kushites or Ethiopians did at different times. All right, there's no evidence of their settlements from ancient times there. The valley of the Nile is very narrow, not capable of containing a great powerful people. Okay, it's very narrow. It's not the, not like the Mississippi, Sheba, and Saba 
were either one or two cities of the Cushites or Ethiopians, and Pliny says that the Sabians extended from the Red Sea to the Persian Gulf, all right? The true Red Sea, the Gulf of California, thus giving them a whole of Arabia, one part of which it is well known is called from its fertility of soil and salubrity of climate, Felix, or the happy. Dr. Wells states that the Ethiopians of Africa alone are commonly called Ludim, both by ancient and modern writers. But the country east of the Euphrates was called Cush, as well as the country west of it, thus given the capital of Persia, Susan or Susiana, which was said to be built by Menon to the Cushites or Ethiopians, as well as Arabia. Mr. Frey in his vocabulary gives the word Kus as a word whose meaning is unknown. But the Septuagint tells us it meant black. Mr. Hyde shows that it was a common thing for the Chaldeans to substitute the Tau for the Shin. Thus, Kut for Kus. Thus, in their dialect, the Kutites were the same as the Kushites. And where was Chaldea? We're talking about Ireland. If my reader will examine all the remaining passages of the Old Testament, not cited by me, where the words Ethiopia and Ethiopians are used, he will see that many of them can by no possibility relate to the African Ethiopia. They're not talking about that, all right? So he's making a big point here, which I agree on, that they're not really talking about today's Ethiopia and Africa a lot of time in the Bible. Now he's conjecturing and he's putting it in Arabia and where he believes ancient Arabia was based on where it is today. And I know it's hard, but we got to dodge the hijack big time on this. Because ancient Egypt, we know the other Ethiopia or the Western Ethiopians, as the Greeks called the Americans, were right here. Eusebius states that Ethiopians to have come and settled in Egypt. All right, where? Here in ancient America, to marry in the time of Amenophis. According to this account, as well as to the account given by Philostratus, there was no such country as Ethiopia beyond Egypt until this invasion. According to Eusebius, these people came from the river Indus and planted themselves to the south of Egypt in the country called from them Ethiopia. The circumstance named by Eusebius that they came from the Indus at all events implies that they came from the east and not from the south and would induce a person to suspect them of having crossed the Red Sea, all right, the Red Sea, the true ancient Red Sea, from Arabia, so-called Arabia, they must either have done this or have come round the northern end of the Red Sea by the Isthmus of Suez, but they certainly could not have come from the present Ethiopia, not from the one they're calling Ethiopia today. You guys hear what he's saying? But there are several passages in ancient writers which prove that Eusebius is right in saying not only that they came from the east, but from a very distant or very eastern part, a very the far, far, far east. And you know how many times I've told you guys that the farthest east or the far, far, far east, the distant east is America. This is a big one right here. They're letting you know they're not talking about Africa. Herodotus says that there were two Ethiopian nations, one in India, the other in Egypt. And to marry America, he derived his information from the Egyptian priests, a race of people who must have known the truth. And there seems no reason either for them or Herodotus to have misstated the fact. Philostratus says that the gymnosophists of Ethiopia, who settled near the sources of the Nile, descended from the Brahmins of India having been driven thence for the murder of their king. This Philostratus says he learned from an ancient Brahmin called Jachas. All right. And again, who are these Brahmins, these ancient Brahmins? That's going to tie into the ancient Ireland, British Isles history. Another ancient writer, Eustatius, also states that Ethiopians came from India. What India? Because, you know, North America is India superior. Remember the three Indias. These concurrent accounts can scarcely be doubted. And here may be discovered the mode and time also when great numbers of ancient rites and ceremonies might be imported from India into Egypt. For that there was a most intimate relation between them in very ancient times. Cannot be doubted. Indeed, it is not doubted. 
The only question has been whether Egypt borrowed from India or India from Egypt. And it's funny because the reason is so similar is because we're talking about the same place in ancient America. All probabilities clearly for a thousand reasons in favor of the superior antiquity of India, so-called India, the three Indias. Remember, India today was called Hindustan. It wasn't called India. And Bharat, Bharat, not India. As Bailey and many others learned men have shown, a probability which seems to be reduced to a certainty by Herodotus, the Egyptians themselves, and other authors just now quoted, there is not a particle of proof from any historical record known to the author that any colony ever passed from Egypt to India. But there is, we see, direct positive historical evidence of the Indians having come to Africa. Remember Augustus Le Plajon in the book Queen Mu, how he said the Mayas went from, as he's saying here, from India into Africa. No attention can be paid to the idle stories of the conquest of India by Bacchus, who was merely an imaginary personage, in short, the god soul. Dr. Shuckford gives an opinion that Homer and Herodotus are both right, and that there were two Ethiopias, and that the Africans came from India. All right, the Africans, what? They came from where? One of the Indias. The Bishop of Avranches thinks he has found three provinces of the name of Chus, Ethiopia, Arabia, and Susiana. There were three Ethiopias. There you go. There were three Ethiopias. That is, countries of blacks, not three chooses, all right? And this is perfectly consistent with what Mr. Boucher has maintained, that Ethiopia of Africa is not named Chus in any place of scripture. And this is also consistent with what is said by both Homer and Herodotus. The bishop shows clearly that the ancient Susiana is the modern Shusestan or Elam, of which Susa was the capital. All right, I just want to mention here, since they brought up Elam, Elam, the progenitor of the Elamites or Persians, ancient Persians, is actually son of Shem, who is the son of Noah. The famous Menon, probably the son, was said to be the son of Aurora. But Achilles informs us that Sisiani was the mother of Menon, and to him the foundation of Susa is attributed. And its citadel was called Menonium, Menonium, and itself the city of Menon. This is the Menon who was said to have been sent to the siege of Troy and to have been slain by Achilles, and who was also said by the ancient authors to be an Ethiopian or a black. Again, Menon who sieged Troy was so called black, or in another word, Ethiopian. Ethiopian meant dark skinned. It seems that Egyptians supposed that this Menon was their king, Amenophis. The Ethiopians are stated by Herodotus to have come from the Indus, according to what modern chronologers deduce from his words about the year 1615 BC, about 400 years after the birth of Abraham in 1996, and about a hundred years before Moses rebelled against the Egyptians and brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Palaces were shown which belonged to this Menon at Thebes and other places in Egypt, as well at Susa, which from him were called in both places Menoniums, and to him was erected the famous statue at Thebes, which is alleged to have given out a sound when first struck by the rays of the morning sun. Bishop Huet thinks probably very correctly that this statue was made an imitation of similar things which the Jewish traveler Rabbi Benjamin found in the country where the descendants of Chus adore the sun, and this he shows to be the contrary of which we speak. It lies about Busora, where the Sabians are found in the greatest numbers, and who are the people of whom he speaks. The bishop thinks this Menon cannot have been Amenophis because he lived very many years before the siege of Troy, in which he is said to have been an actor. Right, so remember, you know, the chronologies are not correct so that still could be a possibility it seems to me to be as absurd to look to homer or virgil for the chronology of historical facts as to shakespeare milton or any other epic poet these poems may state facts but nothing of historical or chronological kind can be received without some collateral evidence in confirmation 
it never was supposed to be incumbent on any epic poet to tie himself down to mere historical matters of facts. And wherever it is evident, either from the admission of a later historical author or from any other circumstance that he is relating facts from the works of the poets without any other authority, he can be as little depended upon as they can. The bishop has shown that the accounts of modern authors, George Sincelos, Suidas, Pausanias, Dionysius, Perichites, etc., etc., are full of contradictions that they are obliged to suppose to Menons. All this arises from these persons treating the poem of Homer as a history instead of a poem. We shall never have an ancient history worthy of the perusal of men of common sense till we cease treating poems as history and send back such personages as Hercules, Theseus, Bacchus, etc. to the heavens whence their history is taken and whence they never descended to the earth. <clears throat> That's because a lot of these were real people who became allegories, metaphors in these poems. It is not meant to be asserted that these epic poems may not be of great use to a historian. It is only meant to protest against their being held as authority by themselves when opposed either to other histories or to known chronology. This case of Menon is in point. Homer wanted a hero to fill up his poem, and without any regard to date or anything wrong in so doing, he accommodated the history of his poem making use of a menophis or menon, or the religious tradition, whichever it was, as he thought proper. These poems may also be of great use as evidence of the customs and manners of the times, both of when they were written and previously, and very often of dry, unconnected facts, which may turn out to be of consequence. Thus Virgil makes menon black, all right? As does also Pindar. That Pindar and Virgil were right and features of the bust of Menon in the British Museum proof, for they are evidently those of the Negro. It is probable that Menon, here spoken of, if there ever were such a man, was the leader of the shepherds, who are stated by Manero and other historians to have come from the East and to have conquered Egypt. The learned Dr. Shuckford thinks that the troubles caused in Egypt by the shepherd kings appear to have happened about the time the Jews left it under Moses. He places these events between the death of Joseph and the birth of Moses, and he supposes that the Jews left the country in consequence of the oppressions of these shepherd kings. It is very clear that much confusion has arisen in this part of ancient history from these eastern shepherds having been confounded with the Israelites, and also from facts relating to the one having been attributed to the other. Josephus takes the different accounts to relate to the same people. This is attended with great difficulty. The shepherds are said by Manero, after a severe struggle with the old inhabitants, to have taken refuge in a city called Abadis or Abadis, where they were a long time besieged, and whence at last they departed, 240,000 in number, together with their wives and children, in consequence of capitulation into the deserts of Syria. If there were two races of people who have been confounded together, one of which came from India, and overran Arabia, Palestine, and Egypt, and brought thence its religion to the Egyptians, and was in color black, it must have come in a very remote period. This may have been the race of shepherd kings of whom Josephus speaks when he says they oppressed the Israelites. But the assertion of Josephus can hardly have been true, for they must have been expelled long before the Israelites came. The second race were Arabian shepherd tribe called captives, who, after being settled some time in the land of Goshen, were driven or went out into the open country of Arabia. They at last, under the command of Joshua, conquered Palestine and finally settled there. Bishop Cumberland has proved that there was a dynasty of Phoenician shepherd kings who were driven out 300 years before Moses. These seem to have been the Black or Ethiopian Phoenician Mennonites, all right, so called Phoenician. They may have exactly answered to this description, but to his date of 300 years, I pay no attention. Further than that, it was a great length of time. Josephus says that the copies of Manero differed, that in one of the shepherds were called captives, not kings, and that he thinks this is more agreeable to ancient history. That Manero also says the nation called shepherds were likewise called captives in their sacred books, and that after they were driven out of Egypt, 
they journeyed through the wilderness of Syria and built a city in Judea, which they called Jerusalem. Josephus says that Manero was an Egyptian by birth, but that he understood Greek, in which he wrote his history, translating it from the old Egyptian records. If the author understand, if the author understand Mr. Farber rightly in his Hora Mosaica, he is of opinion that these shepherd captives were the Israelites. The accounts of these two tribes of people are confused, as may naturally be expected, but these but there are certainly many striking traits of resemblance between them. Mr. Shuckford, with whom and this Mr. Volney agrees, thinks there were two races of shepherd kings, and in this opinion he coincides with most of the ancients. But most certainly, in his treaties against Apion, Josephus only names one. We shall have much to say hereafter respecting these shepherds under the name of Pali. The only objection which occurs against Amenophis or Menon being the leader of the Hindu race who first came from the Indus to Egypt is that according to our ideas of his chronology, he could scarcely be sufficiently early to agree with the known historical records of India. But our chronology is in so very vague and uncertain a state that very little dependence can be placed upon it, and it will never be any better to learn men search for the truth and fairly state it instead of sacrificing it to the idle legends or allegories of the priests, which cannot by any possible ingenuity be made consistent even with themselves. All right, and I agree with that part. He's saying we have to keep an open mind when it comes to chronology because it's not really correct. And we're going to have future videos on that, something we've been following for years now, uh, thanks to Con Drop when, when we're talking about the work of Anatoly Fomenko. Mr. Wilsford in his treatise on Egypt and the Nile in the Asiatic researches informs us that many very ancient statues of the god Buddha in India have crisp, curly hair, okay, with flat noses and thick lips, and adds, nor can it be reasonably doubted that a race of Negroes formerly had power and preeminence in India. A race of Negroes. You guys see that? So we ain't black watching anything. It's in the temples. It's history. You have to accept it. This is confirmed by Mr. Maurice, who says the figures in the Hindu caverns are of a very different character from the present race of Hindus. Their countenances are broad and full, the nose flat, and the lips, particularly the upper lip, remarkably thick. This is again confirmed by Colonel Fitzclarence in the journal of his journey from India, and Maurice in the first volume of his Indian Antiquities, states that the figures in the caves in India and in the temples in Egypt are absolutely the same as given by Bruce, neighbor, etc. All right, they depict an American Indians, ancient Americans. Justin states that the Phoenicians, being obliged to leave their native country in the east, they settled first near the Assyrian lake, which is the Persian Gulf. And Maurice says, we find an extensive district named Palestine to the east of the Euphrates and Tigris. The word Palestine seems derived from Palestine, the seat of the palace or shepherds. Pali in India means shepherd. All right, you guys see that? So Palestine, the seat of the shepherds. This confirms Sir William Jones' opinion in a striking manner respecting a black race having reign at Sidon. It seems to me that great numbers of circumstances are producible and will be produced in the following work to prove that the mythology of Egypt were derived from India. What India? Ah, America. But which persons were of different opinion endowed to explain away as inconclusive proofs. They, however, produce few or no circumstances tending toward the proof of the contrary, that India borrowed from Egypt to enable the friends of the superior antiquity of India in their turn to explain away or disprove. It is well known fact that our Hindu soldiers, when they arrived in Egypt in the late war, recognized the gods of their country in the ancient temples, particularly their god Krishna. The striking similarity, indeed identity, of the style of architecture and ornaments of the ancient Egyptian and Hindu temples, Mr. Maurice has proved beyond all doubt. He says, Travelers who have visited Egypt in periods far more recent than those in which the above-cited authors journeyed thither confirm the truth of their relation. 
in regard both to the number and extent of the excavations, the beauty of the sculptures, and their similitude to those carved in the caverns of India. The final result, therefore, of this extended investigation is that in the remotest periods there has existed a most intimate connection between the two nations, and that colonies emigrating from Egypt to India, or from India to Egypt, transported their deities into the country in which they respectively took up their abode. This testimony of Reverend Mr. Maurice's is fully confirmed by Sir W. Jones, who says, all right, so before we go into W. Jones, this is exactly what uh, Lepla Jones discovered while he was doing the research in the Maya temples. Uh, he connected everything. Uh, the Mayas going into uh, Hindustan or India and then into Egypt and Africa and all these other places. Now, Mr. Sir W. Jones says, the remains of architecture and culture in India, which I mention here as mere monuments of antiquity, not as specimens of ancient art, seem to prove an early connection between this country and Africa. The pyramids of Egypt, the colossal statues described by Hosanias and others, the Sphinx and the Hermes Canis, which last bears a great resemblance to the Baraha Batar, or the incarnation of Vishnu in the form of a boar, indicate the style and mythology of the same indefatigable workmen who formed the vast excavations of Kannada, the various temples and images of Buddha, and the idols which are continually dug up at Gaya or in its vicinity. The letters on many of those monuments appear, as I have before intimated, partly of Indian and partly of Abyssinian or Ethiopic origin. And all these indubitable facts may induce no ill-founded opinion that Ethiopia and Hindustan were peopled or colonized by the same extraordinary race. Listen, this is what I was saying. Who are these extraordinary people? In confirmation of which it may be added that the mountaineers of Bengal and Bihar can hardly be distinguished in some of their features, particularly their lips and noses, from the modern Abyssinians, whom the Arabs call the children of Kush, and the ancient Hindus, according to Strabo, deferred in nothing from the Africans but in the straightness and smoothness of their hair, while that of the others was crisp or woolly, a difference proceeding chiefly, if not entirely, from the respective humidity or dryness of their atmospheres. Hence the people who received the first light of the rising sun, according to the limited knowledge of the ancients, are said by Apulios to be the Ari and Ethiopians, by which he clearly meant certain nations of India, where we frequently see figures of Buddha with curled hair, apparently designed for a representation of it in its natural state. Okay, Buddha. Again, Sir W. Jones says, Mr. Bruce and Mr. Bryant, have proved that the Greeks gave the appellations of Indians to the nations of Africa and to the people among whom we now live. I shall account for this in the following work. Monseigneur de Guinness maintains that the inhabitants of Egypt in very old times had unquestionably a common origin with the old natives of India, as is fully proved by their ancient monuments and the affinity of their languages and institutions, both political and religious many circumstances confirming the above, particularly with respect to the language, will be pointed out hereafter. It is curious to observe the ingenuity exercised by Sir W. Jones to get over obstacles which oppose themselves to his theological creed, which he has previously determined nothing shall persuade him to disbelieve. He says, we are told that the Phoenicians like the Hindus adored the sun and asserted water to be the first of created things. Nor can we doubt that Syria, Samaria, and Phoenice, or the long strip of land on the shore of the Mediterranean, were anciently peopled by a branch of the Indian stock, but were afterwards inhabited by that race which, for the present, we call Arabian. Here we see he admits that the ancient Phoenicians were Hindus. All right, the ancient Phoenicians. He then goes on to observe that in all three, the oldest religion was the Assyrian, as it is called by Selden and the Samaritan letters appear to have been the same at first with those of Phoenice. Now, with respect to which was the oldest religion, as their religions were all, at the bottom, precisely the same, the worship of the sun, there is a strong a probability that the earliest occupiers of the land, the Hindus, were the founders of the solar worship, as the contrary. 
when the various circumstances and testimonies which have been detailed are taken into consideration, there can be scarcely any doubt left on the mind of the reader that by the word Ethiopia, two different countries have been meant, all right? Different locations. That's one of the most important things of today's reading, right? Ethiopian wasn't just one place or associated to uh, the Ethiopia of today in Africa, okay? This seems to be perfectly clear. I hope that was clear to you. And it is probable that by an Ethiopian, a Negro, correctly speaking, they just mean somebody, a melanated person, so-called Negro, so-called Black person, may have been meant, okay? A Negro may have been meant when they're talking about Ethiopian, not merely a Black person. And it seems probable that the following may have been the real fact, that a race either of Negroes or Blacks, but probably of the former, came from India to the West, occupying or conquering and forming a kingdom on the two banks of the Euphrates, the Western Ethiopia alluded to in Numbers, chapter 12. Of course, this author is leaving, you know, America out of all this. So he's just putting it where he thinks it is. That they advanced forward, occupying Syria, Phoenicia, Arabia, and Egypt. That they, or some tribe of them, were the shepherd kings of Egypt. That after a time, the natives of Egypt rose against them and expelled part of them into Abyssinia or Ethiopia, another part of them into Edomia or Syria or Arabia, and another part into the African deserts of Libya, where they, call, where they were called Lubim. The time at which these people came to the West was certainly long previous to the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, but how long previous to that event must remain doubtful. No system of chronology can be admitted as evidence. Every known system is attended with too many difficulties. Perhaps chronology may be allowed to instruct us in relation to facts as to which preceded or followed, but certainly nothing more. No chronological date can be depended on previous to the capture of Babylon by Cyrus. Whether we can depend upon it quite so far back seems to admit of doubt. Part of the ancient monuments of Egypt may have been executed by these people. The Menoniums found in Persia and in Egypt leave little room to doubt this. In favor of this hypothesis, all ancient sacred and profane historical accounts agree, and poetical works of imagination cannot be admitted to compete as evidence with the works of serious historians like Herodotus. This hypothesis likewise reconciles all the accounts which at first appeared discordant, but which no other will do. It is also confirmed by considerable quantity of circumstantial evidence. It is therefore presumed by the writer, he may safely assume in his forthcoming discussions that there were two Ethiopias, one to the east of the Red Sea, all right, right there in the Gulf of California, and the other to the west of it, right on the other side of it, and that a very great nation of blacks from India did rule over almost all Asia in a very remote era, all right? We got future videos on all this. We're going to prove it. In fact, beyond the reach of history or any of our records and that's what i'm trying to tell you to dodge the hijack when you're you know stereotyping asians because the ancient asians many look like you in fact many of these are your ancestors that they're talking about in fact beyond the reach of history or any of our records this and what has been observed respecting judicial astrology will be retained in recollection by my reader they will both be found of great importance in our future inquiries and my essay on the Celtic Druids, I have shown that a great nation called Celtai, of whom the Druids were the priests, spread themselves almost over the whole earth and are to be traced in their rude gigantic monuments from India to the extremity of Britain. All right, this is what I was saying earlier the connection with the British Isles and Hindustan. Who these can have been but the early individuals of the black nation? Who are these? Even the Celtic Druids, huh? of whom we have been treating, I know not, and in this opinion I am not singular. The learned Maurices, Kutites, example Celts, built the great temple in India and Britain, and excavated the caves of the former. And the learned mathematician Ruben Buro has no hesitation in pronouncing Stonehenge to be temple of the black curly-headed Buddha. All right, I shall leave the further consideration of this black nation for the present. I shall not detain my reader with any of the numerous systems of the Hindus, the Persians, the Chaldeans, Egyptians, or other nations, except in those particular instances which immediately relate 
to the object of this work, in the course of which I shall often have occasion to recur to what I have here said, and shall also have opportunities of supporting it by additional evidence. And we reach the end of book one, chapter four of this uh, volume. Hope you guys enjoyed the reading. A lot of babies to pull out. Just want you to see it was well known about the so-called black nations of Asia and how and the connection with so-called India and Ethiopia. I'm talking about the ancient Ethiopians, Western Ethiopians, the Nagas who brought this advanced knowledge to these nations of the old world, the Amadu Khans, the priest kings. I'm going to read another chapter of this book uh, in the next video. That's coming right up. Hope you guys again enjoyed this uh, particular reading. Thanks for uh, hearing me out again to read this whole chapter with you. We're talking about so-called Black Buddha. And we're talking about Egypt, ancient America. We know America is the true old world, so let's just apply everything we learned today with the information we've learned the last couple of years. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Awah!